Hi, I'm Kim Davenport. Welcome to Straight Pool, the podcast, brought to you by the Pro Billiards Tour. With my partner, Reed Pierce, we have Jason Shaw from Scotland. He just won his match, and I watched part of it, and he played brilliant. Uh, he's the uh, international champion. In two, you won this tournament in 2019, was it? Yes. And, all and the U.S. Open champion, I believe, yeah, also. Yeah, 2017, 2017, the same 2017. hotel. Yeah. So, you know, he's won so many titles, I can't... Uh, tell them all, but I know in New York, you've won how many in a row up there at Turning Stone? Eight. Eight in a row. Okay, folks. Reed, what do you what do you have a question for this man? He's Being honest, brilliant. I don't know what to ask the man. Uh, I just got through watching him play myself in there. I walked out and it was 7-7. Uh, you ended up winning at 10-7 uh, playing uh, Yap. Uh, you've been playing now for how long? Since you grew up, you grew up. Well, I've been playing. I, pl I played English eight ball. I grew up playing English eight ball. My dad used to be a professional, and then when I was about fourteen, fifteen, I played snooker for like a year, and then I played the first actual first American pool tournament I played was the IPT in Reno, um, and I did pretty well in that. You know, I had never really played much American pool. I'd always watched it on TV, uh, but I went to the IPT and I beat like Johnny Archer. Or, Rodolfo Luat, Tony Drago, um, you know, so I always felt like I could do well in the game. Um, it was just all about finding someone to, you know, put me in these events and kind of look, you know, because it's, it's not easy um, to find someone, especially when the expenses are high. So kind of found someone who did that and they put me in a few events and I, I got to play the U.S. Open um, probably from around 2006 up to about 2010. In Scotland, they used to have qualifiers for the U.S. Open where you would get all expenses paid and all, all that stuff. And I always did well in the U.S. Open, but the first time I ever seen it, I, I showed up and they had like all the champions, uh, with all their green jackets and all that stuff. And I had my dad with me and I was like, I'd love one of them. Uh, you know, I'd love to get it just felt like a real big event, you know. And uh, yeah, I've always it's always something I really wanted to win the U.S. Open. And, I was always close. I finished third, I finished fourth, I finished fifth, finished third again. I was right there all the time. I kept losing Hill Hill matches and very close matches to strong players. But I knew at some point I would break through. And, um, you know, the year I finished third in 2016, I went away and I was, you know, obviously disappointed to lose. But I just worked hard all year. And um, that was my goal. My main goal was to win the U.S. Open. And I came back and I, I think... The closest someone got to me all week was six in the full event. Oh, wow, you're talking about taking it to it. And Reed Pierce won the U.S. Open in 1995, and I'm the only one here without a green jacket. But no, that's not true. I have a green jacket from the Hall of Fame, and I did win the Masters one year okay. before you were born, I believe. So <laughs> so did, did you have growing up, uh, you, you grew up in Scotland, right? Did you, did you have, like, there was somebody that you looked up to from Europe as a, like uh, uh, maybe a Ralph Suke or, or some of those guys or somebody local? That uh, well, my dad wanted... used to be a professional, okay. so my dad was the guy that okay. I looked up to. You know, the, my dad was who took me to all his events that he played, and I used to go and watch all the pros. I used to watch everybody, and I used to always get in trouble because when the matches were done, I used to sneak into the arena and caught all the balls left on the table and you would always hear on the mic from the tournament director, Jason, get off the table, you know, <laughs> and you would hear that all day. And, you know, I just wanted to watch, learn and, and then just, you know, keep keep going there and, and doing that stuff. But obviously in Europe, I always got to, I never played a lot of American pool, but I got to watch, you know, the World Pool Masters on TV, the World Championships when it was in Cardiff. You know, you, pl you played in that. Yeah, that's um, good, yeah. So I used to get to watch all that stuff on TV. And um, yeah, you know, I, the, the, my, one of my favorite ones was the Challenge of Champions, uh -huh. yeah. the ESPN. I liked how that was set up. And uh, yeah, it's, it's funny because some of those events that I had watched all, all my life, I've won some of them now. Right, and right. Um, yeah, it's just, it just feels surreal sometimes when I, when I think back how, what I used to do and how I used to think about it. And, how I went about doing it. Um, yeah, just, my, my dad was one of the ones I grew up uh, learning from, but if it was through nine ball on TV, I used to love watching. I, I like Bustamante's game. I love the way he's so, he's so free flowing. Um, Earl was just Earl, right? You, you can't not love Earl. He just, oh, yeah. 
he's just um, he's a shot maker. I'm a shot maker, so that was something I, I loved. The the cue you play with, uh, tell us about it. It's longer. Exactly. Do you want to tell us exactly how long yeah. it is? I mean, because I noticed you were playing, and it looks like it's well over 60 inches, right? Yeah. So my cue is 65 inches long. Um, I have my cue is 58 standard, um, and I have a seven inch extension on there. So it's it's pretty big. Um, but the main reason for me using that was around 2000, and I moved here around 2014. And it's funny enough, me and Earl actually shared an apartment for like a year in New York where were the house pros at the pool room. And he always had that extent. He always had a longer queue and, you know, Earl was always trying stuff out. Yeah. And I kind of went to, you, you know, they have the extension for the middle of the queue. I tried that and I didn't really like it. And he always says to me, you know, a longer mm -hmm. queue is better. It's what. So I started using it and I didn't really, you know, it wasn't really for me. And then I went to the Derby City and they had a, a big foot, 10 foot table. And I always was getting the bridge out. I was always stretching. And I said, you know what, I'm gonna go, when I go back home after this event, I'm gonna try the extension all year and I'm gonna play with it. And hopefully next year when I come here, I won't have to stretch and, you know, I'll have a little bit more better control on the table. So I played with it all year and I did pretty good with it. And then um, I went to the Derby City and we had the Bigfoot and I won the big foot. So after the big foot, the nine ball and the one pocket and the bank starts. So I go to my bank match, take the extension off. I go to play and I'm like, I can't make a ball. It felt like I was using a little like short stick. So I put it back on. I said, okay, I'll try it playing banks in that. And I played unbelievable. I got to the final of the bank pool, finished fourth in the one pocket. I was, you know, so I just kept it from there. And ever since I've been using it ever since, but it seems like a lot more players now have gone to the longer queue. You know, like Earl, Shane, Eklund, Catchy. There's, and, and you see a lot of people with um, mini extensions around three inches, not as big as what we have. So it does, it does make a difference in the game when you're shooting balls from the back rail. Your cue, your cue stays on the cue ball longer. It doesn't come up, up. Yeah, it doesn't kick up. And yeah, like I said, you don't have to get the bridge out as much. So in other words, the longer cue you think it just it just fits you better or, or is this a, something that's going on throughout the pool world yeah i feel like a lot if you go in there and look at a lot of players now they're either using a, a little extension right. around three inches or someone's using a bigger one um it just feel i don't know it feels like you can get through the cue ball a little bit more you know you're not really stopping you're you're going through it so, and I'm i feel sorry. i feel like the longer shots i don't know it seems like they're a little bit easier or is it a composite cue? Um, I, I, I mean, have, carbon fiber cue? No, I don't use carbon fiber. I'm not. Just wood? A, yeah, I'm a, just a maple shaft. Um, oh. I'm not a big fan of the carbon fiber. I don't mind the brake cues. I have one at home. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a wood guy. I, I, I grew up playing with wood all my life. So why change now? You is know? it a special shaft, though, that it has a, less deflection? Yeah, it's a low deflection shaft, and it's around 12. It was, when I started using it, it was around 12.7. But I've had it turned down by Joe Blackburn to 12.4 to, to something a, a little bit thinner, a little bit longer taper on the queue. I don't like a, a thick, thick shaft. Right. What happens to the balance point when you bring it out? that many more inches standards 58 and you got it at 65 i mean that's seven more inches it's because i noticed i was watching you play and you don't hold it back like a lot of the europeans are all the way back on the, yeah. on the button i'm you, like you up and, more conventional yeah like, like we used to play so does, does it change your balance point on it it does a little bit obviously my cue is 18 ounces with without it on and it's 22 well nearly 23 ounce with that on it so it's that, that much 23 more. ounce yeah so it's real heavy you know and then i give someone it to use they say hey can i hit a couple of balls and i'm like yeah and they hit one ball and they're like nope I, I, this is too heavy but like you know I, it's something i played with and i got used to over the last like six seven years so it's not just something i think you can just pick up and think oh i'm gonna be good with this but there has a couple of players that have picked it up and they've been like, man, this hit's good, you know? So I think it's more preference. Um, but as far as the weight in the queue, it doesn't really, I think, you know, if you, if you put a weight in the middle of the queue, 
all the weights in the middle so it's kind of going back and forward you don't really have it go more weight to the front or the back so it doesn't feel good in the back the extension doesn't feel heavy in your hand you know it doesn't feel like it's heavy um but with it on it it kind of kind of plays really I think you should try it if you could. If you could try <laughs> you it, then, warned, then you would be like, "I let Mike uh, Mike Siegel hit a couple of balls with it, and he was like trying to chalk it. <laughs> he, he was, he was. Um, he's like, how can you play with this? You know. So yeah, I think it's something that if you try, you might like it, and you know, if it's not for you, you might have to play with it and kind of mess around and see if it fits your game. But you know, it fits my game. I love it, and uh, yeah. I don't think I'll, every time I went back to a shorter queue, I thought, let me try. I'm like, nope. Yeah. Now, we were talking to Earl earlier. We did a, a podcast with him, and he claims that he's the one that got everybody to start using the 65 inch cues. Yeah. And so he, he's taking credit for everybody playing no, great. No, he, he should take credit because uh, the first time I ever met Earl, <laughs> I was in Steinway Billiards in New York, and I seen him chalking his cue, and he was like on top of a chair trying to put the chalk on it was that long he had it actually longer before his was like 70 odd his was really long and um yeah i think everybody kind of just went it was he started using it me shane we were all kind of just following well following the legend well he he is a legend and i'll tell you what you're already a legend and there's no telling how many tournaments you're going to win because you're really pretty young and what really impresses me is that you keep your composure when you're out there playing. You know I mean? You don't really try to show any emotion because I, that's kind of the way I played. I didn't really want to, you know, show, show any emotion. I, I always thought it felt, showed a little bit of weakness. Now, I could be wrong, you know, yeah. that's just the way I felt. So, and you won all those tournaments, eight in a row up in, up in New York. Now, that, that's something that I've not heard of hardly anybody doing. I think Earl back in the day won nine or something at uh, on the Ohio Open. But to win that tournament with that strong appeal eight times in a row, that, that's yeah, that's that's, that's, that's right. unbelievable. That's like that's, uh, un, that's amazing. Maybe one of the greatest. I mean, it might be your biggest feat, not not individual tournament, but doing something like that is. I don't know that anybody maybe's ever even done anything like that. You might be the only guy to ever do something like that. There's I mean, actually Johnny Archer's won six. Shane Van Boren's won six. Turning Stone. Yeah, they both okay. won. So Johnny was in. Johnny was in the lead. And then I came along, and Shane was like behind him with like three. And then I came along, and first couple I played in, uh, I kind of finished like the last eight. Um, and then I won both in the same year. They have two every year. I won both in the same year. And then every year since then, it's just been, I don't know, it's weird. You know when you go somewhere, you just feel at home? Like when I come here, I feel like I've got a lot of support. I feel like, you know, a lot of people around here really enjoy watching me play. So I feel when I come here too, I feel like, you know, relaxed. I don't feel like, you know, some places you go to and you don't have that, that feeling. I think here I've had a special feeling, you know, um, I've won the US Open here and the International Open. And, um, you know, the US Open, something I always wanted to win. So coming back here always brings good memories. And uh, same as going to Turning Stone. Every time I go there, I just, I just feel like I'm gonna win. You know, you have that. Yeah. yeah you know, you have that winning feeling. Yeah. Um, and everybody, because I've won so many times, everybody just thinks, "Oh, he's gonna win again." Well, so when I play people, they just fall over as well. Well, as good as you play, they're gonna think that. Let me ask you this, Jason: the break shot. Um, there's a lot of different ways that y'all play it. I mean, uh, you go to different events. You're, you're breaking uh, out of the box. Uh, the one on the spot. The nine on the spot. Uh, what other ways are there, and which way do you think it really is the best way to play for it to be a better game? Well, you know, we had we had the one on the spot with the magic rack. Now, you can close your eyes and hit the one ball, and the wing ball will go in. Now, that's not really no. we're not really playing pool at the end of the day when it comes to that because now everybody's breaking from the side rail. They're not breaking hard. They're hitting the one ball, the one ball's going three rails and it's landing over the pocket every time. So you're never really getting some players have a chance to shoot. You know, we were going to some events and people were flying from all over the world, spending three, four thousand dollars to get there. And they lag off and lose the lag and the next time they come to the table it's eight zero, race to nine. 
you know, it, it's just, um, it's not fun to watch for the fans either because you want to see two guys battling it out. You want to see you come to the table, play some nice kick shots, some nice safeties. You want to see that in the game. Um, now, I think all the players came back together because since 2000, and when I, when I came to the US Open around 2014, they had changed the break rule where it was the nine on the spot. But you could break, um, you had to break inside the box. And not one person complained for four years. Nobody, nobody had a, nobody had a bad word to say about the event. This was where everybody enjoyed coming. It was like, oh, the, it's a pro, feels like a proper event. You have to play real good to win. And then now all the players have had a chance to vote and vote what they want to have as the break. Because I think the players should have an opinion, you know. It, it, it's, it's their livelihood. You know, it's okay for the tournament promoter to put the event together and do all that stuff. But I think the players should have a, have a, a, a word in, in what happens as far as it comes to the rules and the conditions of playing. And they gave us that choice and we all voted for the break box with a nine on the spot. And the magic right now, when you're breaking with a nine on the spot and inside the box, you have to cut the one ball a lot with spin. So now if you make the one in the side, you might never see the two ball. Right. Also, if you hit it bad with spin, you can scratch in this pocket here in this side, or you can come off the rail and scratch in the other side pocket, or you can hit it with real bad spin and scratch. So there's a lot of like different things. Both players are getting a chance to play the game. And, you know, people come here to watch their players, and who wants to come and watch someone who can't get up out of the chair? You know, and no. it, it's just, um, I feel going forward, this is the best way to have the, the rules, and all the players want it like that, so... I think they made the right choice in asking the players what they want. Like I said, at the end of the day, it's our livelihood. This is how we make more money. And it's important not to, to make it too easy because there's too much talent. Um, and if it gets tough, then everybody's going to have to play well and not just get up there and just run out you know, so easily. So let me ask you a question about that break shot. Uh, and do you, does anybody or do you ever try to make the nine come coming off the rail and then back into the nine? The year I won the U.S. Open, I made the nine ball on the break two or three times. Um, from the quarterfinal to the final, I made it two or three times in every match. Right. Okay, I was so coming off trying the, to make it. Well, I, I was trying to go into the nine. Sometimes I would hit the nine and make it cross, cross side, or I would hit it and hit it on the top side and cut it in the straight corner, in the corner goes yeah, straight or, in. or hit it from the underside right. and cut it in the side pocket. But there's a lot of things that can happen there. You can hit that nine on the top side and scratch in the side, or you can come off the bottom side of the nine and scratch in the corner. So it, it's, you're never going to get an easy layout after the break. You're going to have to work for it, you know. Like I just said there, you can make the one as many times as you want, but if the two ball goes all the way around the table and lands on the top rail, at least the guy has to do something now instead of just rolling the one in and rolling the two in and running out. It's, it's definitely the best way to play nine ball, and uh, I'm sure 99% of the pros would agree with that. Looks like the, that the diamond tables rails are playing more consistent than what when we played on diamonds back in the day. They had a had a tendency to jump more, you know, and hop and do different things. I notice in there. It looks like they're playing really, really good. Yeah. So are they, or am yeah, I they, just no, getting no, they are. So I think not. So if you were to go to Q Masters Billiards and go in there, they have the red label diamonds, and we played on the the pro the pro M blue labeled uh, diamonds. The old red label diamonds have higher rails. Okay. So I feel like the ball. It's too high. It's too it high. Bounce. It'll it'll bounce. it'll hop off the rail. That's what I was you just saying, I mean? right? It gets like, it gets like trapped under there a little yeah. bit, yeah. and then like boings off the rail, and it gets real bouncy. And and when you have a ball on the rail, let's say you had a ball in the side pocket, and you want to get real flat on the ball to roll it in, you can't do it. You got to like, you know, you got to raise your bridge right. up to hit down on the ball because if you were so, to go flat, your cue will just go right over the cue ball and you'll so miss you. So the oh, I see. Okay. So, so they I fixed, noticed. Okay. They I fixed the rails. Yeah. They they I think they they came down with them. Yeah. They're, they they have the diamond tables are probably the most consistent as far as like rolling like one piece slate. It's hard. You know, it's easy to get it the way it is. When you put a three piece slate on, sometimes it might not be 
um, get joined yeah, up. Yeah, get probably. jointed properly. So some of it might roll a little bit, or if you see people leaning on the table many times, it can you know affect the balance. But as far as having these t uh, tables at these events, it's definitely um, more consistent. Uh, that, like you said, the rails are not. You don't see that. You might see the rail bouncing a little bit more, but it's just down to humidity. Right. People around the table, uh, maybe cold air pumping down on the table and stuff like that. But like you said, it's definitely not like um, before. I, I understand what you're saying because I just played straight pool in Q-Masters and they have four blue diamonds at the front and the rest are all red labels. So when you're playing straight pool over there, you're scared to go off the rail, you know, because it's... Right. You, a, you end up getting out get of shape for you. the break shots, so you're scared of pulling out of some shots, and then you go to the other table, and it plays completely different. So well, I, it, I, thought, I thought I caught on to that in there. I was thinking, like, am I seeing this wrong? Or, or, no, you're or right. Oh. You're right. So let me ask you a question since you brought up straight pull. Now, your high run is 600 and how many? Well, it's actually or seven. seven it's, so it's gotten more since I, I yeah. haven't got updated yet. So it's 714. But 714. Supposedly, when I was on 669, I um, I touched a ball. But I've watched the, the video a million times, and I've I had many people look at it, and nobody thinks I've touched anything. But in the rules of straight pool, an exhibition play, it's cue ball fouls only. So even if I did touch a ball, I didn't touch the cue ball. Right, right. So as far as I'm concerned, it's 714. And they can call it what they want. If they want to call it 669, I've got two records, right? So do, so do you know who else holds that record of 714? Babe Ruth, right? <laughs> You're exactly right. Good one. The man from Scotland knew it. Why are the European players becoming, um, y'all are all of a sudden dominating pool across the globe you know other than the, yeah no you, we, we still have the uh, filipino players yeah. and we still have some of the chinese players um and we do have some american players i'm not I'm not saying that but do you think that maybe i mean i don't know i'm asking you this question i feel like you would know it is is the snooker background coming out and some of the snooker players that are not quite good enough to make the snooker tour coming out and uh, at a younger age and starting to play nine ball uh, what is it? Why, why all of a sudden is it so many great European players? I feel, I feel like in, in Europe, um, you know, not that America, America has amazing players, you know, there's a, Shane Van Bowen's oh, one know, of the, yeah. you know, they have many great players. It just feels like their younger players or they don't seem to be coming through quick enough, you know. I feel like in America, a lot of bar table is what's holding back the young talent because in most bars you got in America is all bar tables. Right. So when they're playing on bar tables all the time and they're playing for four, five, six, seven years and then they get to a nine foot table, they're like, well, it yeah. feels like a 12 footer, right? right? It does, it feels huge. Um, but European um, young generation and now even a little bit older, just the, the way that some, some countries are set up, you know, you have like funding from the government you know, if you do well in European championships and you win gold medals and different kinds of stuff, they'll fund you to, to go to events. And a lot of places in Europe too, they have a lot of coaches for different countries where before like European championships, the players that are picked, maybe let's say there's 20 players that are picked, they would have to go on a, a, a couple of weeks coaching. So they have like a room with like eight tables and you have to go there every day, four or five hours, and it's just drills, 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 drills. Oh, well, there's Straight the, ball, eight there's ball, nine answer. ball, 10 ball. You know, and you have wow. that around. There's a few places that don't have it. Um, you know, like Holland, they have it. Denmark, they have it too. Um, Austria, they have all that stuff, you know. They, they, they get funded. If, um, if they win something, they get awarded with like, you know, medals and certificates and they get grants and stuff for pool. So I do believe in Europe, they have that, um, that little bit of help around them to keep pushing them. You know, it's so easy in America just to go to the pool room and you win $5,000 one night and you're like, oh, well, I found yeah. the gals is gambling yeah, every yeah, night, yeah. right? So it becomes more of a hustle than a, than a job, right? Right. When I came to the States, the same thing, I, I came here and the guy I was with was like, look, we're going to keep you undercover, we're going to, and I was like, I don't want to do that. 
No. I want to take me to somewhere. I want to play. So the we'll first, so first person I played was Earl. I played him on a ten footer. <laughs> I played him two thousand a set, and I beat him both sets. And then I played Ronnie Alcano, Bustamante. Played. I played them all. I, play, I I wanted to be the best player. You know, I didn't want to be in a pool room gambling, hustling. I knew I I seen that type of thing in the States when I was around. I seen it in the pool rooms, you know. See the same guy in there over and over every night, same clothes sometimes for two days, you know, and that on that grind, that, right. that hustle. You just never know when you're gonna have money in your pocket. You might have money in your pocket one night and lose it all the next night. So I never wanted to be like that. When I grew up I always played in tournaments. I never came from a a money side of the the game like, like money matches i played like money matches but not that wasn't that wasn't my thing i wanted to be a winner a tournament player and you know i i told the guy that and he was happy with it and he supported me and yeah i really that was my goal i want to be the best player you know i want to be remembered i want to leave a legacy i want to do all that stuff you know i think being a gambler and a money player yeah you can win as much money as possible but who's going to remember you for winning 20 30 thousand you know nobody yeah. and that's how i look at it i feel like american players not there's a lot of young juniors coming through i will say that there's a lot more now i see it in the american side um there's a lot of good talent they just need a little bit more guidance um a little bit more. I feel like in America they should put something together, maybe a couple of different places if they could, where you could go and have like training camps, boot camps. That's what they have in Europe, boot camps. That's what we call it. Um, so where the kids well, go in and just play. Yeah, so you would yeah. have like two guys there who were, let's say if you're in Holland, if you're a Dutch national, I believe that before the European Championships, there's like one or two coaches there and they all come in that room and they're there for four, five, six, seven days and it's the first couple of hours is straight pool and then it's like, you know, um, nine ball or ten ball, whatever the disciplines are coming up and that kid there, this kid that just walked past, he's from Poland, they have a real big thing like that. Poland. Yeah, they're, they're, they have so many players right now coming through that is really big. The Polish people, um, they're really starting to come of light. Uh, I think Poland has one of the most bigger, um, like kind of boot camp training things around now. So you're saying look out for the Polish people. The Pol they're yeah, they've been, they've been, they've been knocking on the doors. They're, they're always close. They're right. always uh, real close. That kid that just walked past is only 18, 19. And he was like the youngest Euro Tour winner. Right. Uh, so, and we were we were talking earlier about uh, there's a lot of incentive in Europe. It seems like to to become a a, a good player, and you you know what I mean. The government subsidizes yeah. you or whatever. And I think in America we have so many sports that not that you guys don't. Yeah. I mean, but 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 we just have so many other sports that they can get into and play. So I don't know if we're losing that. Or I don't know for uh, their parents. Well, we're going this way, or they won't let them go to the pool, or the image is hurting us. I don't know. I think a little bit has to do with we have a lot of different sports in America. Yeah, I think so. You know, you you've know. got like American football, you've got baseball, you've got you know, you've golf, got, yeah. you got golf, you got tennis, you got all sorts of different stuff kind of now. Right. Like you said, that maybe There's bowling is hey, big. You, and, you go know. outside in a nice summer's day and play baseball or do whatever or go to the pool room and, you know, right. and stay in there for hours and hours. You know, I, when I was younger, I used to, I used to love going there all day because that's what I love doing. You know, I used to still play soccer and I used to, I think if you've got the, I think if you play pool for the first few times and you get that love for the game and you've got that drive and you love it, then it's something you really get the itch to do. You know, pool's one of those games. Um, I feel, not, like I said, I feel in America now, there's a lot more juniors coming through. You know, I see it. I, I, if you asked me three years ago, I would have been like, no, nah, I, don't, I don't see it. But now I do see it. They have a lot more junior events. They, had, uh, they have the junior event here going on now. They just had the, the junior open at the U.S. Open. So I can see it growing. I can see it starting to, they're starting to get the juniors in with the pros at the same time. And, you know, having them there and watching the pro matches, they'll learn from that stuff. That's how I learned. I learned, you know, watching pro people, I learned all that stuff. Seeing it eye to eye is way better than seeing it on TV because you can really see what's going on. You can sit front chair and watch the guy, watch the best players do it. We had a podcast earlier, uh, and I 
uh, I had that conversation. We had that conversation with a gentleman, and that's I brought that up to him, uh, Rahana. Uh, he and I brought that exact fact what you just said there. I told him I thought that they we needed America needed to get the kids out to the tournaments more playing possibly some kind of way to qualify to get in more of them to get in and if anything else what you just said to show up into the tournament yes, site that, and watch yeah them, that right? that's that's the yeah. that's the way and i feel like now these kids are here and I, I was playing my match there and i looked around and i seen a few of them sitting in the stands they're watching they're trying to learn and you know they, they want to see how we're breaking or how we're playing certain shots or what we're doing with the cue ball and different push out situations where it's tricky where maybe they they wouldn't know what to do you know so they're they're, they're trying to pick up and it's good that they're having these events because it, it can only attract more younger players and uh you know who's to say that young one kid might go home and hey what'd you do last week oh i was, was at the junior event at the international open check this video up you know and then one kid says oh i might want to play pool you know so you have to keep pushing that as, as much as possible. And, you know, I love helping junior players. Um, you know, I, I did the Super Billiards Expo. I had my own booth there. And every day I had juniors in there playing on the table, let play with them, you know, give them that experience playing with top players. That's that's all you can do is is give them motivation and try and help them grow. So no doubt. Let me ask you a question. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what do you think is wrong with uh, pocket billiards today, if anything? Um, I don't know. It, it seems like it seems like pool now. I feel like pool's getting a lot more. It's getting a lot more bigger. You know, we're having a lot more tournaments. We're having. I think, like we're talking about, I think getting these junior players involved it might bring bigger people into the. You know, outside sponsors. You know, seeing that we're trying to bring the younger generation up to. You know, and I think having that around might push it a little bit. If it gets on TV and people start seeing, you know, junior players at these events with the pro players and stuff like that, it could get bigger, you know, we could get bigger sponsors. I think pool still stuck a little bit behind. I I'm, I don't know for what reason. Is it the, the gambling reason? Is it the being in the pool room all the time, stuck indoors all the time? I, I, do, I really don't know. I, I feel like pool has gotten better over the last couple of years. There's way more big tournaments now. There's a lot more pe players playing. There's a lot more better players playing now, younger, hungry. And um, I just feel like it might take someone from outside who's not involved in pool to just see something, you know, and come in and put a little bit of money into the game. And, and you know, that's all it takes. It takes one person. It takes one big sponsor to do it. If one big sponsor comes in and other people see it, then that's all it takes to blow it up. But we're still looking for that. That that thing to take pull to the to the next level, you know, like the the big Knicks, the big step. You know, I watched ESPN and I see Tag and Cornhole on there. You know, like, like I'm not, I'm not, I don't understand like, it. I, I don't. I just don't get it. I don't. I don't get it. I'm watching guys running around playing tag, and I'm like, five years ago I was watching pool on here. What happened to that? Where did that go? Yeah. I'm watching two guys tapping each other's bums. It's a, you know it what I mean? Makes no sense. Like, come on. Like, and then I see the prize money, and it's like 100K to the winner. I'm like, what is going on in yeah, this world? Yeah, this guy as good as you play in yeah. there. Yeah, I'm sat at home. I'm thinking, this guy's just tapped that guy, and he's won 100,000. Why? What's going on? What's, what's going on? <laughs> Bill, it, it just seems like something's not grabbing the, 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 the right thing to, to really blow up. And, um, yeah, you know. We have Matchroom Sport, who's who does the Moscone Cup and does all the big events and that. They're trying to push it as hard as possible, you know. They're really pushing it as much as they can. But we need someone from outside who's not involved in pool at all. You know, we need a big company, you know, even if it's a watch companies or car companies or something that is somebody who is willing to, you know, lose a couple of million that's not going to make any difference to them. Right. Right. That's what it's going to take. You just and I feel like the more, the more the pl the players have to sell it a little bit more too. You know. Yeah. It's all right going to events, but you have really need to like try and push your social medias and you know, just express everything about pool when you get a chance. You know, talk talk well about it. You know. Well, I know this. Uh, being here to be able to interview you is uh, you've been one heck of a 
interview for us. You're, you can tell the way you handle yourself. You're an amazing cat. I can just tell you that. I didn't see it right of you. Let me ask this. What is your goals in the next five to 10 years would you set a goal of any sort? Do you set goals for yourself? Where do you see yourself five to ten years from now? Well, I'm hoping to hit the Powerball next couple of days. <laughs> That's like 1.5. Would you keep playing pool if you did? I, I tell you what I'd do if I won the lottery. I would turn pool into, we'd have the biggest pro tour and it'd be on a 5 by 10 table. I would change it. I would five change ten. five by ten. I think that's what that's the pros. I think that's what the pros deserve to play on a tougher table, nice and snug pockets, four inch. You know, let's really see Who the let's see the big dogs come out. So right? we would call that the Jason Shaw Open. Yeah, I would, I would, you know, I would, well, but there's a lot. That. There's a lot of players that play well on the, like Fedor Ghosh yesterday. He won the big foot. Yeah, I watched and he, play, he, yeah. his his TPA score for the full week was nine seventy. So for nine, the week? Yeah, for the week, every match he was not over 960, 970 every match. Oh I, think he, I think he made in, in four matches, I think he made two mistakes, one, three mistakes, and I don't even think he missed. I think it was a bad safety. But yeah, I think in five to ten years, obviously, my next goal is I want to win the World Nine Ball Championships. Um, and I just want to try and win as many tournaments as possible and just you know, make a big legacy and people will always remember who I am. And uh, yeah, just just wanna do the best I can and win as many events as possible. Well, Jason, you know Good. what? It's been an honor to nice be able to you, uh, interview Appreciate you. Um, I'm a fan of yours already and I'm definitely a fan now. Uh, I, I know, let Kim Thank tell you, you very much. Thinks. And I, I can tell you one thing, you're well on your way to the Hall of Fame. There is no doubt about that. So you just Appreciate keep no playing place. like you're playing and I enjoy watching you. And folks, we're going to wrap it up here. And for Reed Pierce, Jason Shaw, I'm Kim Davenport. ProBillardsTour.com.